Hey everyone, my name is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO of Product School. And I'm here with a very special guest today because surprise, surprise, he's not um, just a product leader. He's actually a product led VC, Blake Bartlett. Uh, he works at OpenView. So, hey Blake, have, welcome. Hey there. Thanks for having me on and, and great to be here. All right, I need to ask this first. So, what does product led VC mean? Yeah, so it means I'm a VC. Uh, and I'm a VC who loves to invest in product-led growth uh, specifically. So uh, we can talk more about what product-led growth is. But, you know, for, for us at OpenView, um, you know, as a firm, we invest exclusively in SaaS businesses. Uh, and we invest um, at a specific stage of those companies' development, which we call expansion stage. Um, but then over top of that, if we think about areas in which we're particularly excited within expansion stage software product-led growth or bottoms up in the enterprise, self-service customer journeys, all those kinds of things uh, are certainly some of our favorite types of businesses. Um, and, and the results are obviously there for these types of businesses as well. I can't wait to dive into all things. Uh, but before I also want to learn a little bit more about your own story, like how did you go, how did you get into VC and uh, all things tech in general? Yeah, so I got into VC, um, through actually directly out of undergraduate, um, which is a little bit unique. It's becoming more popular these days. Um, and it's not a glamorous job uh, straight out of undergraduate. I will tell you that for sure. Um, and what you'd end up doing is effectively acting as the sales team, uh, in many cases, kind of like the BDRs or the SDRs for a venture capital firm. And, and so in the, in the industry, we call it direct sourcing. Uh, so you're basically cold emailing founders. Um, many of you, if there are founders on, on this call, uh, probably have gotten cold emails from VCs. Um, and that was me <laughs> back when I was 22 years old, just cold emailing as many people as I possibly could, trying to figure out you know, what businesses are interesting, trying to build a pipeline. Uh, and then once you actually find something, uh, doing some due diligence on it and kind of progressing from there. So I started out you know, in that uh, very, uh, very much entry level role within VC. Um, and then have been able to to expand from there. Um, I was most recently before OpenVO was at a firm also in Boston called Battery Ventures, where I was for about five years and invested in great companies like Wayfair and Glassdoor and um, a handful of others, and then have been at OpenView for the last seven years. So you are one of the few pure breed VC investors that I know. You know, like usually people have other different careers and then end up somehow in, in as an investors. Yeah, definitely. There are there are the paths where you have started as an operator before, or maybe as a founder before, and then you get into VC later in the career. And there are certainly career VCs uh, as well who have spent you know more of their time doing pure investing. And so I'm definitely on the uh, the career VC side of the house. So you know, as a founder myself, one of the complaints usually founders have is that oh my god, like this VC or this investor doesn't get it. They don't use my product. They are just looking at the financial. So it's really cool. To, to know actually the way I found you was some of the videos that you put out on, on LinkedIn uh, to give updates on, on tech and product-led companies. So I would like to learn more about how you got into really hands-on VC and, and caring so much about products. Yeah, so I would say it's honestly from uh, just having a lot of curiosity. Um, if there is one core skill set that, uh, that VCs must have, uh, it's kind of non-negotiable, and that's intellectual curiosity, um, which sounds really fancy, but really it can be annoying at times as well, because you're the person who just keeps saying, why, 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 why? Um, that's my favorite question. <laughs> and so honestly, I think um, I, I got into sort of being passionate about the actual underlying aspects uh, of, of a business versus just the financials by really asking those why questions. Um, great. You have great financials. Why? Uh, why are your uh, why is your product so great? Um, why do people like using it? Um, who's using it? Um, why did they switch from what they were doing before to to what they're doing now? Um, why do they love this feature? Um, why is that defensible? You ask all these questions, and then you start to get down to you know bedrock uh, or first principles for that individual company or that individual product, and then you do that again, and you do that again, and you do that again, and you can start to see trends. You can start to connect those dots, and so. Yeah, thinking through it from a from a first principles level with uh, intellectual curiosity as being the motivator, it's kind of how um, you know many VCs are wired, and you kind of have to, otherwise uh, the the job gets pretty grueling uh, if if you don't just innately enjoy doing that. Another thing that I found very unique 
is the approach that not just your firm, but you, you yourself takes on, on product. You call yourself a product-led VC. Your companies also mentioning on, on their main homepage that they are a product-led uh, VC firm. So tell us a little bit more about what that really means, uh, because we, we I've heard that term so many times, especially during the last months. Is, is that really new? And like, how is that different from traditional mindsets in product? Definitely. So uh, the definition of product-led growth is that it's an end-user focused growth strategy that relies primarily on the product itself as the core driver of customer acquisition, conversion, and expansion. So that means that you're leading with the product from a go-to-market standpoint, as opposed to the old world where you'd be leading with sales and marketing. And so to, to make it very, uh, very visceral, um, I, I like to ask the question of how did your company adopt Slack? Or you can pick your favorite you know, new tool. How did your company adopt Notion? How did your company adopt Airtable? How did your company adopt Trello, Calendly, Zoom, Datadog? You know, the list goes on. And for almost all of those, I would say, I can tell you how you did not adopt it. You did not adopt it because somebody cold called you and said, hey, do you wanna buy Slack? Hey, do you wanna buy Trello? Hey, do you wanna buy Notion? Um, you also didn't go to a trade show and walk up to the booth and say, hey, what is this uh, Slack thing? Can you tell me more? Could you give me a demo? You know, that's how you traditionally have discovered software. And so, again, you're leading with sales or you're leading with marketing. But all of those tools that I mentioned, the way that your company adopted it is because some random person at your company found it. And some random person at the company fell in love with the product. And then they started collaborating with their team. And to the outside looking in, if you weren't that individual person who brought the product in, that product just sort of magically showed up one day. You're like, when did we start using Notion? When did we start using Trello? I thought we were using Monday.com. You know, um, that is how software is adopted today in the enterprise. It just sort of serendipitously, seemingly magically just shows up. And so that led us, we saw that happening with some of our best portfolio companies. So Datadog, we're one of the biggest investors there, Calendly, Expensify, Postscript, a number of others. So we saw this dynamic and, and asked ourselves this question, why are these products magically showing up in the enterprise and why are they performing so well from a growth standpoint, but also from a bottom line capital efficiency standpoint. And that sort of put us down the rabbit trail of figuring out what makes these companies tick, how are they different? And we started to realize this exact dynamic that they're leading with products, um, that they're starting with self-service, that they're orienting towards an individual end user, and they're leaning into that as opposed to the traditional way of, uh, you know, just hiring a bunch of salespeople and, and hoping that customers come after that. And I totally buy into that philosophy as a product person myself. Uh, I, I almost, almost feel like taking a little bit of the B2C playbook to B and allowing customers have a voice and not just the CFO or whoever said check at the end. Yep. No, I think that's a really good uh, example because um, I refer to, again, we talked about end users. And to me, product-led growth is really about the end user. And enterprise end users are consumers. They're just consumers who happen to be at work instead of at home. And if you're going after the end user and you're building a product for the end user in the enterprise, and then you're trying to distribute the product to that end user in the enterprise through self-service, Again, thinking about that person as a consumer, right? Because like the things that you love and hate, whether you're at work or whether you're at home, uh, they're the same. And so if you're signing up for a new consumer app, you don't want to talk to a salesperson. You don't want to have to fill out a form. You don't want to put your credit card in. You want to have that 30 day free trial of Netflix before you actually swipe the credit card. You want the very easy, very swift onboarding for you know Uber before you take your first ride. You, you don't want those humans friction in the funnel. And so if you take that and you apply that then to the enterprise and say, okay, consumers don't want to talk to people. They don't want to fill out a long form. They don't want to be asked to pay before they are asked to, to pay and swipe the credit card before they've actually gotten that aha moment. And so you just copy paste a lot of those consumer oriented product um, sort of mentalities and you bring them over into the enterprise because that is the world today. And that really is the sort of unlock moment for, for product led growth is when you start thinking more like consumer product managers and consumer growth teams as opposed to traditional enterprise um, orientations. I, I saw you, you guys recently published a benchmark report on, on SaaS products. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, so every year OpenView releases a report that we call the um, expansion SaaS benchmarks. And so that is um, you know, our, our survey of the market for SaaS metrics. And so you'll see your normal things in there, you know, 
the growth rate of a business, you know, the CAC payback period, the you know, gross retention, net retention, you know, burn rates, you know, the stuff that you would expect to see from a you know an industry survey for for SaaS metrics. Um, and we've been doing that for for a number of years, and it tends to be very popular. A lot of people in the market really love it. Um, but we also started to to realize that there are additional questions, especially in a product led model, which is great. Like these are the the industry standard CAC um, dynamics. Well, what are the leading indicators in product uh, that I should be caring about? You know, what are the sign up metrics? What are the activation metrics? Um, you know, what percentage of people have free trial versus freemium? You know, things like that that are more about the product and product metrics than they are about like the end result, which is the SaaS metrics. And so that's uh, the, the report that you, you mentioned. So we did the same thing, surveyed the entire market, but instead of asking about um, SaaS metrics, we asked about product metrics. We published that um, a couple weeks back or a couple months back, um, and it's been, uh, it's been very successful. So I encourage folks to check it out if you're interested in those types of topics. One one thing that I've noticed, especially at the enterprise level for even some product-led companies, is that they're not getting rid of their sales team. It's just that they probably take action a little bit later in the process or when the, the, the deals are larger and involve some type of customization. So I want you to talk a little bit more about that relationship between product-led organizations and the sales team so people don't freak out and think that, oh, my God, now product is everything and now we don't need anybody here to sell the product. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And I do find this to be one of the common misconceptions about product-led growth is that um, the question is, is product-led growth anti-sales? Um, and the answer is no, <laughs> it is not anti-sales. We love sales, we need sales, but exactly as you were mentioning, uh, you change the order of operations as to when you hire sales and when sales gets involved. So back to some of the things I was talking about before in the old world, sales leads and product follows. And then now in the new world, in the product-led world, it's just exactly inversed, where product leads and sales follows. So any of those examples that I talked about, you know, Slack, Notion, Calendly, Airtable, all of those kinds of things, like Dropbox as, as one of the earlier ones to do this, you know, they land with that self-service adoption. There's then internal virality and collaboration. The account starts to grow. Um, again, there's probably some swiped credit cards, but then at some point they're ready for a much larger implementation. They're ready for a much larger contract. And that's a perfect opportunity for a salesperson to call in, identify, okay, where on the enterprise Slack grid should you be and help me help navigate you through that. Let's make sure we get all the enterprise features you care about. Let's get the payment terms that you care about and all that stuff. But it's, it's more on the back of um, product adoption and the fact that people love the product. And so the salesperson is no longer convincing them that you should use my product and not my competitors. Instead, it's much more of a customer success like conversation, which is how can I help you get more value out of my product because you've already adopted it. So sales comes later, but there still is very much this uh, very important role for sales in a product led journey. Now, I want to learn a bit more about that because I can imagine you have a huge deal flow. There are so many opportunities uh, that you can't just attend just because of the demand. So how do you go about that? Is there any type of product led basis? Yeah, I mean, um, there are definitely things that I find to be litmus tests. Um, if I'm ultimately talking to a business that I that has a product-led growth mentality and model, um, some of the first questions are, great, well, who is your end user? Um, and what is their pain? And how does your product specifically solve that pain? How are you distributing your product to the end user? And then what are some of the metrics you're seeing to suggest that it's working? And if people can't answer those questions, then it's a pretty good indication to me that you know they're earlier in their product-led journey and, and, and maybe meet, need more time to mature before I'm ready to have a, a serious conversation because those are foundational questions, right? Um, and so at the other end of the spectrum, if somebody has really solid answers, no, we know who our end user is, we know what their pain is, we know how our product solves it, you can see the messaging directly on the website, here's how we distribute it, we leverage this viral loop, Here's what causes people to convert. This is our North Star metric. It corresponds to our aha moment. Then we bring in the paywall. You know, these are the stats we're seeing for conversion to paid. You know, when somebody just, it's very clear when somebody gets it from a growth standpoint or from a product like growth standpoint. And um, that's kind of what I'm looking for as, as a, in an initial conversation. You know, are we on the same wavelength or am I needing to do education uh, to somebody about product like growth? Because if the VC is educating you on product, not a good thing. <laughs> um, I should have some helpful frameworks, but you should be uh, way more knowledgeable in product and operations than I am. 
I agree. Although I have to say your your LinkedIn show, uh, PLG123, it's pretty educational. I've learned a lot from it. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. So um, it, it's a good call out. So yeah, we have this weekly show that we do on my LinkedIn channel called the PLG123. And um, so one, uh, it's one, two, three, because I do three news stories a week and it's three tabs. And so I open three tabs in my browser. Uh, I think it's the three most interesting stories in product led growth from the prior week. And then we do a little bit of a news show about those three tabs. Um, and we, we started by doing them all released on one particular day, um, you know, uh, like a Thursday or something like that on LinkedIn. And now we do it sort of one tab per day um, to have sort of more small snippets, uh, two to three minute videos that people could watch. Um, and, and the idea behind it is um, was really honestly going back to this, some of the misconceptions about product led growth, one of which is that um, that it only applies to Slack. It only applies to Notion. It's um, and, and there could be this 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 sort of dismissal, which is like, hey, I serve oil and gas or I serve manufacturing or I'm a cybersecurity company and I'm serving the enterprise. So that stuff is great if you're Slack and you have emojis in your app. But I serve real enterprise buyers. Right. Um, and it was kind of this perception that product led growth is an isolated thing that only applies to like Silicon Valley startups. Um, and so the idea behind the PLG one, two, three is like, no, everywhere you look is product led growth. Uh, and there's way more businesses that embrace product led growth than you appreciate. And so how can we illustrate this? How can we help people to understand that product led growth isn't new? Survey Monkey's been doing it since the late 90s. Atlassian's been doing it since the late 90s. But what has changed since then to where it's not just two companies, but now it really is the majority of the interesting companies everybody wants to emulate is embracing product led growth. And so how can we sort of create more awareness around this that PLG is everywhere? And so that was some of the intent. And that's kind of what you see coming through uh, in those three individual tabs in a given week. So I'm very passionate about lifelong learning, obviously. And I always like to ask this question, which is like, what are you learning these days? What do you think is that next? frontier for you? Yeah, so uh, we coined the term product led growth back in 2016. And then if you followed anything about OpenView in the last four years, you know, we have been talking about it until we're blue in the face. <laughs> so uh, we're big fans. Um, but then in the last, I would say, year to two years, it started to turn into not just something that OpenView was talking about, but instead something that many other people are talking about. And it's become a community and it's become a movement. And that's been great to see. But, you know, now that we're a couple of years into that, um, I started getting a lot of questions that I didn't have the answers to. Um, back to that question about, you know, salespeople, um, I could tell you that, you know, we're not anti-sales, that product leads and sales follows. But then what happens next is invariably the detailed questions of, OK, great. Well, when does sales get involved? How do I make sure that sales isn't cannibalizing my self-service funnel? Um, how, how do I make sure that I'm not using all of these expensive salespeople to call leads that are only ever gonna be a $50 a month account. Like, how do I actually do this? When do they get involved? What are they doing? What does this look like? And I was honestly saying, well, like this is kind of how Expensify does it, but like beyond that, like, I don't know. Um, and so it became a conundrum. Um, and, and honestly, I've found one of the best ways to learn is by asking people that are smarter than me uh, and a way to do that scalably that's also you know valuable for the person that I'm asking is to actually just have them on an interview like we're doing right now. And so I'm the host of our podcast. And so what I tend to do is for each season of the podcast is figure out what is the question that I'm getting most frequently from founders that I'm scratching my head about, I don't have an answer to. Let me go interview the best people in the world about that. A, it'll create really great podcast episodes, but also at the end of a 10 to 12 season episode or episode season, um, I will also hopefully have a better answer to those questions that I was scratching my head about before. So that's kind of some of the things I'm learning and you know, using a podcast as a, sort of a way to kill multiple birds with one stone uh, has been super effective. That's so cool to hear because I'm doing the exact same thing with product management. So when I started the company, I can only learn so much about it, but at some point I had to involve the best of the best and ask them honest questions about where's this going? How do you think about it? And by first of all, selfishly trying to ask those questions, I and opening up the gates to other members of the community. I think everyone wins. Definitely. So another thing that I always struggling with is, okay, we, we've talked about product led growth quite a bit. We know that product leads sales follows, but who is really in charge of product led? Is this a product manager thing? 
Is the marketer going to be involved? Like, who really carries that hat? Because I'm struggling to understand if this is a job that will eventually exist. Is this going to be a product-led growth manager for a company? Or how do you see this fitting into the overall picture? Yeah. Um, so I think of product-led growth as not being an individual isolated strategy. It's not a tactic. It's not a department. It's not an individual person. It is much more sort of an orientation or ph philosophy as to how the company operates and how they're choosing to build product and approach product and how they're choosing to approach distribution. And so to, to give another example, because I see it as being very parallel, if we rewind the tapes back to the early 2000s, uh, when the, the, the concept of SaaS uh, or cloud-based software first came onto the market, um, and it was, it was only the, the early adopter companies like this little company in San Francisco called Salesforce and others that were sort of advocating for SaaS, and back then there was this perception of like, okay, that works for the San Francisco based companies, but like the enterprise is never gonna go to the cloud. Come on, let's be honest. And here we are two decades later and like, obviously it's changed. Um, but you could have asked the question of like, okay, great. Well, who's responsible for SaaS um, at your company? Who, who, who owns SaaS? You know, who's, who's the, the chief SaaS uh, officer? And it's like, no, that's not the right question is, are you believing in SaaS and are you going all into SaaS? And if so, then it needs to change how your entire company orients. Um, and so I think of product-led growth as being similar. Um, so who owns product-led growth? Everybody in the company owns product-led growth. Um, there certainly is you know, very particular things that a product manager uh, will be thinking about or that a growth person, um, whether you're growth product or growth marketing, will be thinking about. Um, and, but it also, again, as we were talking about before, it changes the role of the salesperson. It changes the role of the success person. And so it really is kind of it's owned by everybody, which means that at the end of the day, it needs to be owned by the CEO as well. Because if the CEO is like convinced that sales is the greatest thing on the face of the earth, but then you have one product team who loves product-led growth, like there's going to be oil and water and that's never going to work. I agree with you. Um, and I hope to help you in that battle because at the end of the day, I think this mindset is not just owned by a single person or team, and it has to be a team effort. Um, but hey, we have good examples, as you mentioned. We, we saw SaaS, we saw cloud. Now you look back and it's like, of course, it makes so much sense. Why didn't we do it earlier? This is, it sounds, I've seen that movie before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what does your day to day look like? Yeah, so day to day um, looks like a, a few things. Um, so definitely spending a lot of time thinking about and creating content towards product-led growth, um, mostly posting on LinkedIn, doing these videos, doing things like that, hosting our podcast. So that ends up being a good chunk of my day. Um, I then spend the majority of the rest of my day doing two things, uh, and they're both related to entrepreneurs. So it's either talking to and doing Zooms with a bunch of entrepreneurs that um, we're evaluating or getting to know. Um, and that could be just a first conversation, some of those questions that I mentioned before. It could be sort of a follow-up conversation. We're going deeper into sort of use cases, deeper into roadmap, deeper into sort of growth tactics, whatever it may be. Um, but spending a lot of time with, um, you know, sort of prospect entrepreneurs that are somewhere in our funnel and they're evaluating us as well. So we're also trying to sell and convince them that OpenView is awesome. Um, and then the other portion of my time is spending time with entrepreneurs that we've already invested in, right? So portfolio companies, you know, either as a board member, officially doing board business, attending board meetings and stuff like that, or, you know, much more informally, which happens a lot more frequently, which is just, you know, spitballing with them on, you know, key executive hires and candidates that are in the uh, funnel and pipeline, talking about product strategy, talking about competitor intelligence. Um, and that could be, you know, getting on the phone for 30 minutes, or it could be just, you know, uh, texting with CEOs, which I do every single day. So that that's the majority of, uh, of the time spent as a VC. I can totally see how the VC industry is also evolving quite a bit from my early days in my previous company, raising money, uh, talking to people who I knew would never get my product they, because they didn't want to either. Like, and to now really seeing the value that some VCs really bring to the table, I think it's extremely relevant, especially for founders that, that are also product builders, that they want to have a partner in the room instead of just a, a check. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, people will often say this, and it's true. Um, but you know, everyone's money is green, and so and and if and this is also true, especially right now because of how crazy the market is. If you're building a great company, if you have great metrics, like raising capital is not hard. Um, there are there's a long line of people that will like happily write that next check for you. So now you need to decide, okay, well, which check do I take? 
Um, and that starts to be what is the actual mindset of that person? And are they going to sort of be aligned with me? If I'm product led, are they going to sort of be aligned with that? Um, or are they going to be saying like, when are we hiring the enterprise sales team? Um, sort of things so you want to make sure that there's a philosophical alignment, but then there's also, you know, what does this look like practically? You know, who's in your network and have I gotten exposed to any of them? Um, are you actually going to sort of be able to, uh, to make introductions or do things that I'm going to find to be, to be valuable? And so, yeah, there's this kind of two way dynamic where I think a lot of times the historical perspective, um, uh, can still be lodged in people's minds, which is that like VCs sit in their ivory tower and like sort of act more like Shark Tank, but like all of you like, you know, wanting, needing entrepreneurs come in and we just sort of do the Caesar, Julius Caesar, yes or no. And it's just not the case at all. Um, when there's so much capital in the market, we are, you know, aggressively needing to chase entrepreneurs and convince them to take our money instead of all the other VCs money. And the way that we show that and the way that we differentiate is both through the mindset um, of, yeah, you're product led, I'm product led, here's where you should be going. And like, you know, kind of trying to develop that sort of view of trust that we're on the same wavelength. But then also seeing what can you, what points of evidence can you bring to bear? Not only are we on the same wavelength, not only are we speaking the same language, but like, let me introduce you to five people who are going to say the same thing you're going to find to be valuable. Let me connect you to some candidates. Let me, you know, do X and Y and Z that uh, that helps you to basically try before you buy uh, with a VC um, because that's uh, that's what people want these days. It's almost like applying product led mindset into VC. Yeah, yeah, definitely. People want the uh, the proof of value and the aha moment before you ask them to convert. Well, it's been great to to share this time with you and, and learn about your 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 product led mindset and all the perspectives. So, is there anything else you would like to add before we wrap things up? No, this has been great. And um, look for anyone who wants to learn more about product led growth and understand sort of how can we adopt more of these. Uh, practices into our company. I'm open for business, always happy to uh, to chat about all things product led. So just look me up on LinkedIn, shoot me a note, shoot me a message, um, and we'll happily uh, you know spitball with you as well. So um, looking forward to it. And thanks so much for having me on the show today.